Hello, I'm Austin McCormick, and you're listening to The Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. All right, welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Today, I have Brother Tim Carter on the podcast. And Brother Tim, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, I asked Brother Tim to come on to discuss uh, a topic that we're going to be addressing today. But before we do that, Brother Tim, would you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name's Tim Carter. Um, I'm an elder at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Sedalia, Missouri. I've been there uh, serving for well, about nine years now. I, I started on staff there as a uh, student and administrative pastor uh, in June of 2010, right out of college. I uh, went to Southwest Baptist University. I uh, actually got my degree in economics and finance. So uh, God kind of changed my course for me uh, right out of school and uh, began serving in the local church there in Sedalia and uh, have been there since. Uh, over that time period, my roles have changed a little bit. I'm now an executive pastor. I serve in the lay leadership uh, role where I'm uh, now bivocational. I serve uh, the church on, on a volunteer basis, doing some of the same things, uh, but a little bit more oversight and uh, teaching. And uh, I work a secular job during the day and, and serve the church uh, as much as I can uh, when I'm not working. Um, also, i am uh, been involved in apologetics, which we're going to talk about on this episode today and uh, had the opportunity to uh, get to know a lot of people in, in the field of all apologetics. And uh, I have a Facebook page. Um, it is Tim Carter Apologetics uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can find that at facebook.com slash Tim Carter Apologetics. Um, try to deal with uh, worldview issues, things that go on in our culture and how we address them uh, from a biblical perspective and how we defend the faith uh, in those conversations. And uh, just last year, I, I got the opportunity to finish up my master's in apologetics through Columbia Evangelical Seminary, uh, where I've been able to do uh, some different things with some people I've met there. Um, also a member of the International Society of Christian Apologetics uh, and uh, in the Missouri Baptist Apologetics Network. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you more questions about yourself, but for the listener that doesn't know exactly what apologetics is, can you give us maybe some kind of uh, definition or exactly what uh, the the study of apologetics consists of? Yeah, so when we talk about apologetics, um, there's kind of two aspects to it. So there, there's a defense of the faith and there's a commending of the faith. Uh, on, on the defense side, you know, it is an engagement with those outside um, of our perspective, those who would not be believers, uh, those who not believe in Christ and have their faith in him. There's an aspect of apologetics where we defend uh, the Christian faith. Uh, we defend uh, the revelation that God has given to us in Scripture about who he is and what he desires for our life. And uh, we, we do it in such a way that is respectful, but also hopefully leads others to the truth to ultimately come to Christ. Uh, the other side of that is there's a commending of the faith where uh, we're not necessarily defending against um, those outside of the faith, but we're uh, instructing and teaching those in the faith on how the Christian worldview applies to our life and how uh, we can uh, validate the claims of Scripture. You know, sometimes it's through archaeological evidence. Sometimes it's through uh, history and, and philosophy in, in different ways. But we, we take uh, what Scripture gives us and we, we demonstrate to those uh, around us that uh, the Bible is the true Word of God and that Jesus Christ is uh, God in the flesh. Okay, yeah, awesome. Uh, so... If we look at the Bible itself and we are looking at Holy Scripture, where are some places that we can go to look at to uh, give a case for why we do apologetics? Okay, yeah, there, there are a couple of scriptures. I'll, I'll point out two passages. Uh, the first one is 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 13 down to verse 16. It says this, it says, Now who is there to harm you if, there, if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, 
you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So in this passage, um, Peter is, is writing to his readers, and he is uh, commending them. He is exhorting them to always be ready to provide an answer uh, to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. And uh, this verse, a lot of apologists go to and say that this is a, a justification for our defense in the faith. And I would agree, uh, but at, on the simplest level, um, there, there are some things that we need to understand in, in what's being said here. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy. That if, if we're going to engage in apologetics and defending and commending our faith, uh, we need to do so in a way that honors Christ, the Lord is holy. That means set apart far above uh, everything else in our life. Um, that we are to hold him as the standard and, and the one, and the weight and the measure that all things are to be uh, compared against, that, that we are to submit to his lordship in our life and submit to the revelation he has given us in scripture, and that we allow the Bible to shape our arguments and govern how we present the faith and defend it to those around us. So, which leads us to always being prepared. Um, you know, as, as a Christian, as we dive into scripture, Apostle Paul tells Timothy that, that Scripture is good for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. So as we go to Scripture, we can be fully equipped and ready to provide a defense uh, for the faith or the defense of the, the reason for the hope that we have within us. And, and what's interesting here in this passage, when you look at Peter and, and who he's writing to, this is this is a group of believers who are uh, suffering persecution. They're 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 being thrown up against some very vile and, and wicked men and and there's a fear probably in their life of, of what might happen to them as they follow christ and and what people might say and and the hope that i would, would argue the hope that is in them that they, they are to defend is the gospel itself and so when they're faced up against these trials and persecutions and people see hope in their life um, they're to give a, a defense to anyone who asks them for why they have hope, even in death, in facing persecution. And, and that is the gospel itself. So they are to defend the, the truth of the gospel and always be ready to do that. And, you know, that can come out in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it's a simple conversation with somebody of a laying out the narrative of the gospel and how God works in our lives and how God desires to reconcile us with him and why we need to be reconciled with him. Uh, when you go a little bit more scholarly and, and, and get into uh, more of the academic side of things, it, it turns into looking at the archeological evidence and, and validating the resurrection and then giving a defense for how we can verify uh, the faith that we have in Christ and, and, and prove that it is true from the word of God. Um, so that's, that's one passage that we look at. Um, the other passage is found in Jude, uh, verse 3. It says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I have found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That, that Paul, even himself, found it necessary at times to contend or to defend the faith. Um, and as believers, you know, it, it's not as though that we just have a need to have a common knowledge of what our faith is, but we need to so grow in our knowledge of the scriptures so that we can articulate and defend what we believe and, and point others ultimately to Christ through that. And the word that we have for defend uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 15, the word that we develop this, this English word defense from is apologia. And that's where we get the word apologetics from. This is the idea that we're to be give give an apologia uh, or a defense uh, for the hope that we have within us because of Jesus Christ. Very well said. That was exactly what I was looking for whenever I asked you that question. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for giving us a biblical uh, 
explanation of why we are to do apologetics. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do as an apologist and uh, ways that you can help serve the local church with the gifts that you have been given by God? Yeah, you know, one, one of the great things about the Christian faith is that uh, when we go to Scripture, we have the divine revelation of God, that we have a, a word uh, and a revealing of truth from the being that created all things and sustains all things. And, and the great reality about that is that God knows everything about everything. Uh, he is all powerful. Uh, there, there's nothing that, that he cannot do outside of himself and outside of his nature. And when we understand who God is, that God knows all that there is to know, uh, it really brings with it a weight and authority to his word that he's revealed to us in scripture. So when we go to the Bible, we can be confident that as we apply the truths of scripture to our life, we can address any issue that comes up uh, that we might face. And, and that's what I really like to do is, is to demonstrate to people how we can use the Bible and a biblical worldview to address false religions in the world, to address cults in the world, uh, to address issues that arise within the church and, and, and doctrinal issues. And, and so, you know, what I like to do is, is really address any question that comes up. I, I like uh, to, to see how the Bible will apply to all areas of life. And, and that's really kind of where my heart's at, you know, as far as like specific topics um, that I like to discuss is the inspiration of scripture, uh, the canon of scripture. How do we know we have the right books? Um, I hold to a, a self attesting model to the canon of scripture that the, the Bible in what it is testifies to itself of, of what books belong that we don't have to appeal to uh, outside sources as an authority to, to tell us what scripture is, but we, we can know from the very fact that it's God's word and, and there's evidence for that within scripture. I, I really like to spend a lot of time looking at that, especially with the new Testament, um, Mormonism, Islam, um, cultural issues like abortion, uh, and, and the pro-life movement. Um, LGBTQ questions and, and dealing with um, a, a biblical uh, answer to those things. Um, there, there's really nothing off the table that, that I won't try to address. Um, and if it's something that I don't know, I, I love diving into new things. Um, but you know, that's the great thing about scripture is that you know, we can be confident in the truth that God has revealed to us. And uh, there, there really is no question that we can't address. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you address certain topics like uh, Mormonism, Islam, pro-life, uh, inspiration of skip, scripture, the canon of scripture. When you do this, does it commonly take place in the form of a, a formal debate or maybe a Q&A? What ways can you help serve the serve the church, maybe if you were invited to do something? Yeah, so uh, what I've done most of is, well, I do a lot of Q&A. Um, it, it, it's actually pretty cool. I, I, I've kind of worked with a ministry that operates uh, from a family within our church uh, called Sing for the King, and, and they go to prisons and they do prison ministry all over the state of Missouri. And I've had a great opportunity to go with them multiple times. And when I go into the prisons, uh, we just do kind of a Q and A time, and and like literally no question is is off the table. Like you just answer whatever questions there are. We we kind of work through and try to provide a biblical answer to those questions and, and provide biblical perspective from a biblical worldview. Uh, on top of that, you know, I do lecture. I do uh, do presentations on Mormonism, on Islam. I, I've done a lot, you know, as a student minister previously at, at our church, I spent a lot of time, you know, working with our students, working through some of these things. We have a, a big Mormon population in Sedalia, and uh, there, there's not a student in the student ministry that we have at our church that that doesn't run across a Mormon. So we spent some time, you know, going through Mormonism. And, and what I like to do is, is, is try to lay out um, what we believe and, and what scripture teaches. And then we compare it against what some of these other uh, cults and religious movements teach against. Uh, one of the other things that I've, I've talked about in the past too, is uh, Christian mysticism and, and some of the pagan uh, things that we were seeing crop up in some of the Christianity uh, in our culture today. And, and uh, so there's really no form uh, that I limit myself to. I've done one moderated debate uh, with the Taggart podcast where I debated an atheist. 
Um, and that was a good time. I'm always looking for, for, for more debates and, and things to do, but there's really no, no form that I, I hold to. You know, I, I really like the Q&A because it, it provides for good discussion, um, but I also do uh, lectures and, and do a little bit more formal teaching too. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm just so grateful you came on the podcast today. We've been discussing introductory level apologetic information in the ministry of Tim Carter, but I did ask him uh, before we got started if he would maybe hit on one deeper aspect of apologetics, which is uh, a methodology of apologetics, which is, I believe, the uh, methodology that you hold to, which is presuppositional apologetics. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Can you explain what that is? And this will probably be the last topic we address, unless you have anything else. Yeah, so um, when you begin to dive into apologetic methodology, um, and that is, you know, how, how we go about defending the faith, um, there, are, there are differing views on, on what we should take as far as how we go about that process. And, and a lot of it's determined by your theology. Um, you know, your, your theology dictates a lot more in your life than, than what a lot of people realize, I think. And uh, so ultimately your view of God and, and your view of how he has revealed himself to us and, and, and the teachings of Scripture is going to play a pivotal role in how you go about defending the faith. Um, when it comes to presuppositionalism, um, you're going to find differing views. You know, there's not really... A, a good cookie cutter approach, I would say. There, there, there are even some debates within presuppositional camps on how to go about. But I would say this: that, that within presuppositional apologetics, Scripture holds the highest authority. That if, if the Word of God states a truth about humanity or, or God Himself or, or the state of affairs in the world, then that must govern the way that we go about doing apologetics. Um, so, for instance, uh, I am uh, from a Reformed tradition uh, when it comes to theology. I believe uh, that, that God is 100% in control of salvation, that, that he is the one that does the work in our lives, uh, and that he saves us and, and ultimately regenerates our hearts and brings us to a point of repentance uh, by work that he does. So, uh, from that standpoint... I would admit that an argument cannot save an individual. Uh, however, God does use means in order to bring people to the truth. And, and sometimes those means that he uses uh, through our obedience is an, a, an, a, an apologetic argument. But ultimately, when it comes to presuppositionalism, uh, it's built on this concept of arguing from a biblical worldview and not stepping outside of that worldview. Um, for instance, if, if, if I'm going to debate an atheist, uh, one of the things that I'm going to do is point out the flaws in their worldview. That if God, if there is no God, then ultimately they cannot make sense of reality because there's no standard by which reality was created and everything is here by random chance. And if everything is here by random chance, then uh, we are just acting as we evolved to act and there is no right or wrong there is no moral standard and, and it just is the way it is and there's no meaning and purpose to life but the atheist is going to argue for meaning for purpose they're going to argue for objective truth and, and what i do as a presuppositional apologist is is point out to them the flaws in their worldview and show them that they have to step inside of my biblical worldview in order to make the arguments that they're making in, in, a, in a sense they have to sit in the lap of the God they slap in the face. Um, they cannot uh, even make an argument against God without assuming that God exists. Um, so that's an aspect of presuppositionalism, but it really comes down to a commitment to the authority of Scripture, uh, for me at least, and allowing Scripture to dictate how I frame my arguments and, and how far I'll take my arguments. And I don't assume uh, that there is neutral ground in those arguments. Uh, you know, we can see from Scripture, you're either for God or you're against God. You are either reconciled with him through Jesus Christ or you're an enemy of God who suppresses the truth. And as an apologist, I try to point out that truth that Scripture reveals and that individuals suppress the truth when they don't uh, submit to 
Christ in their life. And, and that plays out in different ways. And, and, you know, like I said, with atheists, it, it plays out a different way. When you address uh, a Mormon, it plays out a little bit different. But it all comes back to allowing the Bible to be our ultimate authority in faith and practice. And that applies to our apologetics and our defense of the faith. So it doesn't mean that we don't use evidence. Uh, you know, we use evidence all the time in, in arguing for the faith. But that evidence is framed in a biblical worldview. And we can provide justification for that evidence from the truths of Scripture uh, to hold up as a foundation for our life and in defense of that, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And that's a good word. And uh, Tim, I want to thank you for coming on the uh, Covenant podcast today. Uh, Tim, as he mentioned, has a Facebook Live that he does on Saturdays where he discusses apologetic issues. He's uh, currently been addressing some of the issues that have been going on at Southwest Baptist University. So I would encourage you to check out his Facebook live page, check out his Facebook page where he posts other things. Tim, I'm so grateful you came on today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You have a blessed day. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource or you simply like the Covenant Podcast, head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.